It's really great to see everyone here for the 11th annual David Steffi Address. And this is quite a wonderful event. Billy Steffi asked me to say a few words on her behalf tonight, this evening. She's, this is an evening she really loves. And she's very sorry that she was not able to be with us tonight. Uh, the zoo means so much to her and to the community. And she sends her best wishes to everyone here tonight. And one of the things I really wanted to share with you from Billy is her unbounded love and enthusiasm for the zoo. She is so proud of this institution and she continues to challenge us to reach for the stars and, and to do more. And, and that comes through whether she's here with us or sending us those wishes from her home. Billy's grandkids, Abby and Sydney and Dawson, who I think most of you have met at some point, really think of this zoo as, as their zoo. They live in Florida with their mom and dad, David and Laura Steffi, and they visit here every year, and at least one of them wants to be a zoo vet when she grows up, and we look forward to saving her a seat at the table for that, for that happy occurrence. I'm gonna pause now and, and ask Chris Kuhar to come up and get things started tonight. Um, this is a wonderful crowd and we're really enjoying this lovely new facility. And I think we had almost 200 RSVPs tonight, which is a new record for the David Steffi address. So thank you very much for being part of it tonight. Um, Chris is leading the zoo to new heights and really working hard with his team to align around the zoo's considerable strengths. And it's a, a great pleasure to stand here tonight and to be part of this next wave of exciting improvements and to hear from Chris his vision for the zoo and, and where he'd like to take Cleveland Metro Park Zoo in the coming years. So Chris, please come on up. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So on behalf of Liz Fowler, uh, Jim Francis, and the entire uh, Cleveland Zoological Society staff, on behalf of my staff here at the zoo and the staff at Cleveland Metro Parks, I want to officially welcome you to the 11th annual David Steffi Address. Um, I think many of you have been here for, for some of the previous 10, uh, but this event continues to evolve. Every year we do it a little bit differently. We add some new features. We want to make sure that we're continuing to, to, to change this ad address so that it's the most informative, uh, most informative event that it can be. Historically, what we've done here is we've had uh, professionals come in and talk about their experiences uh, with zoo medicine. That's really how this event started out. And we've changed that a little bit, uh, partly because zoological medicine has gotten so much more complicated. Uh, we know a lot more than we ever did before. Uh, we know how hard it is. Uh, we have higher goals than we ever had before. And it's becoming increasingly hard to separate and talk about zoo medicine um, and not talk about the science that informs it, not talk about the animal husbandry that goes along with making it possible. It's sort of like trying to talk about health without talking about diet and exercise and vitamins and, and drugs. You, you, it, you can do it, but it probably doesn't make any sense. So, and, and, and quite honestly, it's a lot of that other stuff. It's a lot of the husbandry stuff. It's a lot of the science stuff that makes it challenging. It's also what makes us unique. So I'm very excited to, to have this uh, program here tonight. Very excited partly because it's our staff. You know, one of the things that we've done over the past couple of years is really emphasize what our staff is doing. I think we did, did ourselves a little bit of discredit when we have outside professionals come in, when we have literally world leaders in, the, in these topics working right here. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm proud to have them, uh, to be able to come up here and talk to you and be able to tell all of you before they do that, that they're not just my staff, and of course I'm gonna brag on them a little bit, but they're also literally nationally and internationally recognized authorities. People all over the world know who they are and, and what they do. And they're also very young in their career, so there's so much more potential. We have the potential here to be leaders in this field. We have leaders have the potential to be leaders in animal husbandry, conservation medicine, animal care, science. It's what we do. So I'm very proud to be able to, to tell you all that and, and have a little bit of Cleveland pride, recognize what we're doing here in this city, because I don't think we, we, we give that message often enough. It's also exciting to be able to talk about the future. And, and what, not only what we're doing today, but what we're going to do in the future. So before we do that, I just want to say one thing. A lot of what we do here, a lot of what they're going to talk about tonight 
is made possible with the assistance of the Cleveland Zoological Society. The support the zoo receives from the Cleveland Zoological Society is very helpful in accomplishing a lot of this uh, work that we're gonna talk about tonight. And I know many of you are donors to the Cleveland Zoological Society, so I just wanna say, without your generosity, a lot of this work wouldn't be possible. So before we even get started in, in, in all the cool stuff, I just wanted to say a very heartfelt thank you to all of you for helping out with that. Um, your generosity makes a lot of this possible. I also wanted to recognize one, one major donor, uh, Liz mentioned, unfortunately, Billy couldn't be here with us tonight, but Billy Steffi, for those of you who know her, she's really a visionary. She really has an extraordinary talent at identifying talent, identifying people and, and programs and institutions that have really high capacity. And, and more than that, she has the ability to, to support that and enable that and help them achieve those heights. And, and through Billy's support over the years, we've been able to take really good programs and make them truly exceptional. Um, I wanted to highlight three things very quickly um, that, that really make Billy's contribution to us unique. The first is the Sarah Allison Steffi Center for Zoological Medicine. Many of you went and you probably called it the hospital. We call it the Sarah Allison Steffi Center for Zoological Medicine. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but it's worth it because it is more than a hospital. It really is, because not only is it the place where we do procedures and we have our quarantine facility, but maybe more important than that, we have labs where we're able to do a lot of the science that we work on. We have the offices of the veterinary staff and the science staff housed together in one location. That, that facilitates a lot of the collaboration that we look forward to. So that's a very big uh, part of who we are as an organization, and, and Billy's support helped facilitate that, that uh, getting that done. The second thing that we have, and is, is Doc up here yet? And I haven't seen Doc. Uh, uh, Dr. Albert Lewandowski. There he is. Doc, come on, step forward, Doc. Come on. Nice try. So, uh, so Dr. Albert Lewandowski is the David Steffi Chair in Zoological Medicine with a flourish. Um, now, I, I have to point out two things. The first is that. Um, we have three doctors of veterinary medicine here. We have, what, six, seven PhDs, but he's the only one that gets to be called doc. So that says something, right? <laughs> and, and I also want to clarify, the zoo's been open for 133 years. Dr. Lewandowski has not been the vet for all 133 of those years. Yeah, oh, 90, 95. Um, he, he, he has, however, been our, our head vet for 28 years. It's a really long time. And he's been in... <laughs> and he's been a zoo vet for almost 40 now. We hit 40 yet? Close. So, and I, I just want to recognize Doc for a second because the world of veterinary medicine has changed tremendously in 40 years. That's a whole Steffi lecture in and of itself as to what kind of changes we've seen. And I want to thank Doc in, in, in his position as the David Steffi Chair for Zoological Medicine because he's been flexible, because we're learning a lot, and he's been adapting to this new approach to, to medicine that we've, we've taken on here, the integration of science and the integration of husband deer. So I, don't, I want to thank Doc for doing that because that's really important. The third thing that Billy's done for us is this lecture, the David Steffi lecture. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do with this lecture is communicate our message. So we're going to do something unique. One of the things that's a little bit different this year is we're going to use social media because we want, Liz mentioned that we have our biggest uh, RSVP total uh, today, but we want to have a reach to an even larger audience. So we're going to use social media. Those of you who are on Twitter, we're going to actually uh, do some tweeting uh, about what we're going to talk about today. So if you want to use the hashtag 2015DSA, as in David Steffi address, 2015DSA, um, you can retweet things that you hear. You can hear an interesting uh, a fact, interesting story, and tweet that out. Um, so we can reach an even larger audience than who's here with us tonight. Now, if you don't know what a hashtag is, or if when I say tweet, you think of a small yellow bird, never mind. Don't worry about it, OK? The, the, the rest of everyone else will take care of that. It's OK. However, however, this is a good time to remind you this is the perfect opportunity to set your phasers to stun, turn off the ringer on your phone, because we're going to get ready for the good part, OK? So with this, I would like to, to introduce our panel today. Uh, science is, is really hard to communicate to a large and varied audience. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the method in which scientists communicate to each other doesn't work to anyone else. Um, I've made the joke before in presentations that I'm bilingual. I speak scientist and English. <laughs> We've learned that the traditional model of communicating science, this, a lecture often associated with graphs and statistical values, is highly ineffective in communicating how impactful we can really be. What was really impactful is stories. If any of you have been lucky enough to talk to me or any of my staff and hear about what we've been doing, it's the stories that probably got your attention. It's the passion that got your attention. So we tried something a little different last year, uh, and we tried a moderated discussion as opposed to a standard lecture format. And it worked well enough for us to be crazy enough to try it again. So we're gonna do that this year. We're gonna do another modified uh, little lecture format here. And what I'd like to do is introduce our three panelists for this year. So uh, our first panelist, and I didn't tell you guys what order we're coming in, so I'm just gonna sort of pick them randomly. Um, the, our first panelist is Dr. Pam Dennis. Dr. Dennis is our veterinary epidemiologist here. For those of you who don't know what that is, we're gonna have to have her explain that at some point during the address. Um, that'll be question number one, says Dan. So uh, Dr. Dennis. Just come up here. Uh, yeah, no, that's good. that's good, that's good, that's good. Uh, uh, Dr. Dennis is one of those rare individuals who has both a DVM and a PhD, which means she's smarter than pretty much everyone else in this room. Um, and now that she's very embarrassed because I said that. But, but what Dr. Dennis does is really interesting, and we have one of very few epidemiologists, I don't even want to guess at the number now, I know it's very small, who actually look at diseases from more than just an uh, individual's perspective, look at it from a population perspective, which is a very unique way of looking at uh, diseases and processes in zoos. So she's a valuable resource to have uh, here at the institution. And, and, and Pam and I collaborated quite a bit before I got settled with being a zoo director uh, on some research projects that were, were very interesting. And I think Pam's gonna talk about some of those today. Um, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Elena Less. Elena is homegrown talent. Elena started her career here as a graduate student at Case Western Reserve University, uh, received her PhD while she was working here. Uh, I was lucky enough to be on her committee, as was, was Pam and Dr. Kristen Lucas, our Director of Conservation and Science. Um, and her work on gorilla diet is literally changing how we think about uh, primate diets, how we think about uh, gorilla diets. Um, since, her, uh, since she achieved her dissertation, she took a role here as an Associate Curator of Animals. So Elena's a little bit unique in that she has a science background, but what she does on a day-to-day -day basis probably has very little to do with science. She manages uh, our collection and manages the keepers who, who, who manage the collection. So it's a unique perspective of having a science background, but also being able to, to, to work on a day-to-day -day basis with the animals. Our last panelist is Andy Kornack. Andy is our Director of Animal and Veterinary Services. She um, actually started here as a curator of uh, large mammals and carnivores, and actually I worked alongside Andy as curators uh, for about a year and a half uh, before assuming my new position, and then uh, I promptly realized how valuable Andy was and promoted her to the position of Director of Animal and Veterinary Programs. Um, what Andy does is manage the entire uh, veterinary programs division, basically. She uh, manages the vets and the vet staff, as well as the curators and the animal keepers that report to that. So in, in a nutshell, Andy's job is to implement, um, which sounds a lot easier than it is, um, and, and especially when, when our focus here is to implement science and to, to use science to answer questions and, and, and think differently about how we manage our animal collections. So, so we have a sort of a broad range of perspectives in how we uh, approach this. So with that, one of the questions that we really wanted to answer, stay there. <laughs> Very jumpy. Um, we wanted to make sure that as we approached this that we had a good way of telling stories. So we wanted to have a moderator who could ask good questions, who could identify good stories and pull them out. And, and, and last year, Dan Molthrop ag agreed to, to step forward and do that. Um, when Dan struck up a conversation with me in Leadership Cleveland a couple years ago, I don't think that he realized he was being targeted at that point. Um, <laughs> but now, after he's agreed a second time, I can um, officially say that out loud. Um, Dan is the CEO of the City Club, 
And for those of you who don't know, the City Club is a, a very unique forum for reason, free speech, and enlightened debate. Uh, Dan has a, a, has a long history, both as an award-winning journalist, as a co-founder of the, the Civic Commons, and a former host of WCPN's Sound of Ideas, and just generally a good guy. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to bring up Dan Molthrop to the stage, and, and he's going to walk you. us through the Thank evening. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I thought you were going to do one of those things. We were looking for somebody who could ask really good questions. That guy wasn't available, so we got Dan. Um, hi, everybody. So we're, we're going to do this up here for a little bit, and then we're going to open it up to questions from all of you. So if you start, ha if you start getting questions, we can actually start getting questions, collecting questions from any of you who like Twitter, uh, apparently. So if you, if you tweet a question, we'll, we'll be able to get it in early, I guess, if, um, if, the, if the zoo staff is on board with that. Um, so let's jump in. Pam, I promised question number one would be, what is an epidemiologist doing at the zoo anyway? So what do you do at the zoo? Um, Dan did warn me that he was going to ask me this question. <laughs> like, what do I do at the zoo? I look at population. Uh, okay, okay, which okay. he said, that's boring, so don't No, 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 no. <laughs> no so, like, so you just told me earlier, um, I, all I wrote down was feed the cheetah. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> um, but no, you just, you, you just got a new project approved that I think is pretty illustrative of the kind of work that you do. So tell me about the cheetah. What's the problem with the cheetah? What problem are you trying to solve? How do you think you can solve it? Okay. So what I do, and the cheetah is a good way to illustrate that, is I look at um, a species and, and oftentimes there's a health problem. And sadly, in a way, there are, and I tell this to the vet students, you know, you could go into the zoo and you can find a syndrome, an unexplained syndrome, in pretty much every species that we house. Um, and what I, what I want to do is try and figure out why. Why do we have these syndromes? Why do we have these health problems? Um, it's not always, you know, oftentimes it's infectious disease, you know, we can vaccinate or we can treat with antibiotics and we can figure it out that way. But some of these more complicated things like heart disease in the gorillas, and we'll probably talk about that, and diabetes in a lot of our primates, um, we don't understand and we often wonder if it's caused by something that we might be doing. Can we change the way we manage them? And that's why we all work together um, to address it. Cheetah have a lot of health problems that we haven't been able to explain. Um, gastritis, which is, you know, they end up with gastric ulcers. So something that humans get, cheetahs also get them. We can figure out why people get them and we can treat that. We haven't figured out why cheetah get them. We are working on it. So in looking at the health problems that they get, they seem to be related to inflammation. Um, trying to figure that out, you look to their natural history and that's often what I do. I say there's a health problem in an animal. Well, what's its natural history? What does it do in the wild? How, you know, how do we do things differently with it in captivity, and can we try and mimic the wild? So with cheetah, large cats, they eat large meals. You know, they run around in the wild, they catch an antelope, they kill it, they eat it, they rest quietly, take a nap, get back up, play with their kids, and then go hunt another antelope. Well, in the, the nap lasts like two, three days. Two, three days. <laughs> yeah. So every couple of days they're eating. And but here at the zoo. Here, we feed them twice a day. So they're fed in the morning and they're fed in the evening, much like we feed our dog or our cat. Um, so we want to look at whether we can feed them more like they eat in the wild. So give them a really big meal, small antelope size, and let them go for two days without eating, and then feed them another meal. Now, you can do that, but how will you ever know if you've made a difference? So one of the benefits of working here is, is that we say, okay, what can we look at? And we have folks who can say, well, I could train them. I can't train them, but we have keeper staff, wonderful keeper staff who can say, oh yeah, we can do that. So our keeper staff have trained our cheetah so that we can collect blood samples routinely from the tail vein without anesthesia. We don't have to knock them down. We don't have to bring them to the vet hospital. We don't have to have the whole workup. We can say, we need a blood sample. We need it at you know, nine o'clock this morning and I can show up and we can get that blood sample. Okay, how does that work? Mm. <laughs> well, I can say it's very useful for one thing because I often get called in at night to deal with these sorts of issues and I, we actually had a cheetah that was acting ill. I was called in and um, he was so well trained, he accepted me to put the tourniquet on his tail so that the vet tech could get the, get to get the vein. 
So <laughs> essentially what we do is the keepers have a fantastic relationship with their animals. They work with them every day and they work with them a little bit each day. So we shape the behavior. So the first thing we'll do is have the cheetah face the keeper and receive food during that process. Then we'll start to shape them to put their tail out. So we can pull their tail and have them just focus on the keeper and tolerate that. Then we'll desensitize them to a tourniquet going on their tail. So it's just a series of steps of sort of desensitizing. How, how do you desensitize a, um, a carnivorous feline <laughs> <laughs> to uh, meddling with its tail? <laughs> well, I will say that they, they're behind mesh, so we're not in there with them. But it's just very small steps. So it might be just first touching their tail and then just having them get used to that. And then it might just be a very slight pressure. And then, you know, it might take a few days. It might take a few you, weeks just to desensitize. Logistically, I'm sorry, this is sort of a weird logistical <clears throat> question, but like, so, they, so you're here, there's a mesh, a fence, whatever, mm -hmm. cheetah over there, and you're like fishing for the tail with what? Like, what, how does that work? Well, like a stick. Uh -huh. so, so the, <laughs> the cheetah's facing the keeper here, uh -huh. and then the way it goes is that there can be a tech and somebody else um, sort of perpendicular, so that they're, you're right next to where their tail is. And we've actually gotten creative. We have, we'll put up barrels, and it forces the cheetah to kind of come right along the fence line, so they're right there. So we can kind of guide them to exactly the position we want, and then we start to slowly ask for the body parts that we want, and then we just slowly desense. That's really the remarkable. How long does it, what's the time frame? Like, like that's months, weeks, days? What's it really that? varies. Uh, with the cheetahs, I would say it was a few months that it took, but with the gorilla ultrasound, which there's some videos of, it took us uh, probably about a year or two years to get that behavior to be solid. So it just depends on the animal and, and the behavior that you're asking. Okay, we're just gonna put a pin in gorilla ultrasound. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll come back to that one. Um, I would imagine, Andy, that in a, a situation like that, you've got Elena and a, and a couple of keepers working on that pretty consistently. Once they've figured out the routine, then you have to scale that across, the, across your human population of keepers. Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and operant conditioning to have voluntary behaviors has been a heavy focus um, at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo uh, for about the last four to five years. Um, it has uh, been a, a long road to get there, but the, uh, it's paying out in spades. We are able to get biological samples on a reliable basis, which uh, helps us diagnose health issues or do research. Um, and it really minimizes the stress level of the animals, but more importantly, it minimizes the stress level of our keepers and veterinarians. So having that heavy focus and having these animals participate in their own health care, and it is free choice. If these animals didn't want to do it, they're gonna walk away. So uh, we're not really gonna go in and make them stand up next to the masher when we're drawing blood on elephants, you know, make them put their ear through the portal. It is a, some of the processes are longer, some are shorter, um, but training the staff and demonstrating the importance of it, like the cheetah uh, story about being able to draw blood that evening, have the vets run it, look at it and say, okay, this is what's going on with this animal, we can, let it ride overnight and see what it looks like in the morning, or we need to really treat this animal quickly. Mm -hmm. Pam, let's stick with the cheetah for a second, if we could. Okay. Um, what are you measuring, first of all? And then how will you know if you're right? Um, good questions, very good questions. If they're and the wrong ones, tell nope, me. Nope, they're the right okay. ones. They're the ones that we ask that question every day. So that's one of the biggest challenges is, um, well, one would think that getting the blood sample from an awake cheetah would be one of the biggest challenges. But after we jump through that hurdle, um, figuring out what to measure, because we, we can speculate that we need to look at inflammation, but what do you look for in inflammation in a cheetah? And how do you know that you can actually measure it? So those are some of the challenges where um, we have the luxury of being able to have an endocrinology lab. We can um, use assays, we can look to what's done in either domestic cats or other species, or even we turn to the human health literature and say, oh, you know, people are looking at um, this marker for helicobacter gastritis in people. Let's see if we can measure it in a cheetah. And that's what we do. We say, okay, we can take a blood sample. We can see if we can validate these assays. We're going to run them. And then you have to say, well, okay, how will you know if you're making a difference? And what we're speculating is that we're going to do sort of the way our um, 
the way we normally feed, and then we're going to change it. So we're going to go to this feast and fast, and we're going to see if parameters are different. So if things are the same under both conditions, we're going to think, ah, we probably didn't make a difference. If we see a difference and we think it's going in the right direction, so markers that we think reflect inflammation in the cheetah go down, we're going to go, yay, this looks good. <laughs> and then we'll move forward. Just to clarify, how did you know that the cheetah had ulcers? So we don't know that our cheetah have ulcers. We okay. know that the cheetah population have ulcers. And this is often where um, the sort of challenging part of my job, the, the less fun when Dan said, what do you do all day? Well, most of the day I'm sitting on the computer reading papers and, and looking at stuff, really boring, no stories attached kind of stuff. Um, but people, veterinarians um, across zoos, across the SSP, looking within AZA, have found over time doing these anesthetized exams on cheetah that they have ulcers. Now, we know that the, pop, the captive population have ulcers. We know based on research that have been, has been done in the wild that while wild cheetah have helicobacter, which is associated with the ulcers, they don't have the ulcers in the wild. So we know the bacteria is there in both populations, but we only see the ulcers in the captive population. Just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to dig so deep into this, but does that mean that like you would, somebody's anesthetizing a cheetah in captivity and doing like an endoscopy and looking mm -hmm. into their, mm -hmm. their okay, mm -hmm. um, that's and unpleasant. Taking biopsies and yeah. all of that. Now we're not, we're, we will not do that as part of the study. Mm -hmm. um, we could, but then it, one of the challenges is, one, we would have to anesthetize the animal and take the biopsies, um, which is invasive, and it would prolong the, the length of the study. So we would have to then compare those to another biopsy taken a year later. So this way, since it's a pilot study, we're going to do a smaller, shorter period and just look at the... Based on just blood draws. Exactly. Andy, how is this... How is this different from the zoos of 20 or 30 years ago, or you know, the zoos that, that we all would have gone to as children? Um, would, would the zoos not be even like, thinking about this? They, I, th I feel like there was more of an attitude that like, the animals are great, but if they die in captivity, that's just a bummer. We can get another. Well, I wouldn't say that because okay. I was in the zoo business 20 plus years ago. So <laughs> 30, not 30. No, no, not 30. Okay, not see, yet. that's why I said 20, 30 years ago. Okay. Um, it's, it's very different because the foundation of knowledge regarding exotic animals was very different at that time. Um, although research and science has really hit its stride in the past 10 years, uh, you know, it was very difficult to get the information, so you did the best you could. You know, we talked about that a lot of carnivore species were treated like, you know, dogs and cats, so you feed them some dog food, you feed them some cat food, um, or, uh, you know, Lana might talk about later with primate diets, you know, when you're doing nutritional studies, you have very small research um, pool to pull from on nutrition. And so I would say that they, they were doing the best they could with the knowledge that they had. And over mm -hmm. the past 30 years, we've gained so much knowledge uh, through research, not only in zoos, but also in the wild on how we can provide the best care uh, that it really is evolving. Like I said, we're hitting our stride um, in the past 10 years and it, it's only gonna continue. Uh, the more that we can do the research and figure out how to integrate it into our day-to-day -day management of the animals in our care to impact them and have higher reproductive rates, longer lives, healthier lives, uh, it, it really will change the face of zoos in the future. Um, so just to go, we put a pin before in gorilla ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Let's go back there. Okay. Um, how do you get a gorilla to hang out for an ultrasound? Well, it's, it's much the same, you know, so we, we have Carefully. a certain space that they, um, again, they're behind mesh and you can see it if, uh, well, I guess we don't have the videos playing right now, but you can see it in the videos. They'll come right over to the mesh. Um, they'll put their, we've trained them to put their chest up to it. We've gotten them used to the gel. The ultrasound gel was a very big uh, factor for the gorillas. They didn't like the texture of it. They still don't always. I think a lot of humans don't like that. Right, <laughs> right. Um, so we're actually able to see mm -hmm. their hearts. And we were really lucky that one of our volunteers is a, a cardiac tech for humans. So we were able to have her start coming up to the sessions and interpret what we were seeing with the gorilla hearts, which is great. Wow, that would usually take three or four days to get the results back, you know, like with, the, with you know, when you right. send a radio, you know, you need a radi radiologist and then Medical Mutual has to approve the, the expenditure. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have a society. <laughs> I know. That's great. The expenditures. <laughs> that's great. Um, 
So, but you've trained these, the gorillas to do all sorts, to submit themselves to all sorts of things. What's been like your secret sauce on that? Well, I will say it's, it's the staff. It's the keepers that work for me. They're fantastic. And one of them actually just recently trained our gorillas for blood draw. So that's something that is rarely done. A few years ago, they said it couldn't be done. Gorillas, it's too hard to find gorilla veins. Their skin is too thick. It's too hard to find the veins. Um, but we, a few zoos started making some strides with it with female gorillas, and we have uh, two males here, but our keeper was able to actually train it in three months, and we're able to get blood samples on them, which is, which is great. But I just have a, a great staff. They're really committed. They know their training skills, and I just support them. Where's, where are you drawing the blood from the gorilla? Um, from right in their inner elbow. Just the, way, the same way we would get a blood draw. Right. Or Wow. So they have a special sleeve that is mesh all around. They stick their arm through, and there's a little window we can open up, and then the techs can get the blood right from there. They don't need a tourniquet or anything? No. No, they squeeze um, the mesh and kind of pop the vein a little bit. That's awesome. It's great. I'm excited about it. <laughs> Was it, like, would, I'm just trying to imagine, I mean, go, taking your team who had said, who had said basically, no way, that's impossible, to a point of, of of working towards it over three months, mm -hmm. thinking like, eh, we might be able to do this, but who knows? And then like to the point where you could actually do it. I mean, that must have been transformative, not only from a scientific perspective, but also from an organizational and, and team building perspective. It really was from a team building perspective because you wouldn't believe how many people have to get involved in that. So of course we have the veterinary staff that are coming up and dedicating time several times a week to work with the keeper staff on this behavior. And the gorillas don't know them. They don't see them that often. They often uh, affiliate them with a negative uh, experience, but here they're coming up now regularly and they're feeding them grapes, so it's, it's positive. But we also, you know, I spent a ton of time with our welder looking at the sleeve and, well, now can you just cut a few more squares? Because we need to get this exact spot on the gorilla arm. So then we're working with our facility staff to modify Oh, it's a steel mesh. Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> mesh doesn't always imply steel, but that's good to know. It is. Um, <laughs> and, um, and you've come up with a calculation, too, for uh, gorilla BMI, that's body right. mass index. Yes. So that was part of a lot of my dissertation work. Um, so many of you are familiar with body mass index. It's a factor of your Obsessed weight. Obsessed with height. it. <laughs> okay. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm mildly. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did with gorillas is we actually did a seated height versus their weight just because it was easier to train gorillas to sort of sit and present their back so you could just kind of get a height measurement that way. But it was really interesting because as, as I was getting the data in, almost all of the male gorillas seemed to have a similar height. And I knew that wasn't correct because I've been to several different zoos, I collected research at several different zoos, and they, they do vary in height. But as I looked at it further, and I had people get all sorts of measurements, so they would get the measurement of their head, the measurement of a width across their back. And I noticed that the gorillas that were shorter had taller heads, and the gorillas that were taller had shorter heads. And it didn't make sense to me until I realized that gorillas, male gorillas, have a sagittal crest, so they have this sort of um, ridge that's on top of their head, and it's actually, they deposit fat up there. And in the wild, it's a signal to the females that hey, look, I'm really good at finding food. You should mate with me. So these, we're feeding them all very similarly, and we were feeding them um, these processed biscuits that are high in calories. And so we're feeding them all the same. So these shorter guys that should actually be getting less biscuits and less to eat are building these huge sagittal crests that are way, way not necessary. <laughs> But um, so we modified the BMI then to, to um, factor out that sagittal crest and just look purely at their back and then it, it worked perfectly. It matched perfectly with um, a measurement of body fat and the blood that we were looking at. Oh, so you, were, you took it out of the height measurement but exactly. you kept it in the weight measurement. Right. Ha uh ha. -huh. Very interesting. Um, so what happened with the, I, this whole dietary experiment on the gorillas, and it's, it's no longer an experiment now, I guess it's, it's graduated to regime. Mm -hmm. or kind of just standard zoo, protocol. Yes. <laughs> it's the zoo. Um, but uh, what's been the upshot? What's their BMI gone from and to? Well, I can't remember the exact numbers of the BMI calculation, but both of our gorillas lost about 50 to 60 pounds after we changed their diet. Um, their insulin and cholesterol levels went much lower. Their cholesterol level levels were above 200, which is usually you want to aim below that. They're lower. Their insulin levels were, in the, were 20. They're down to 4. So that's a... Does this mirror what gorillas in the wild would be? 
We don't know for sure. There's been some research that shows that gorillas in the wild do have lower cholesterol levels than gorillas in zoos, which suggests there might be something we're doing with our diet that's different than they're eating in the wild, but we don't really know what the insulin levels of a wild gorilla are. Mm -hmm. So we base a lot of it on, on the human literature. We're similar, I'm told. Yes. <laughs> Um, I feel like I, I, I almost wish there was just like a, a big hat with all the names of all the animals in the collection and I could just reach in and be like, all right, so tell me about Pygmy Slow Loris or something like that <laughs> to choose an example at random that I know you're interested in. Um, but no, seriously, the, the Pygmy Slow Loris is, um, you, you all introduced me to the, to the Slow Loris uh, a couple of, a few weeks ago and um, fascinating. This is the, the large, uh, the, the large eyed, nocturnal, tiny, um, Primate. Is that, uh, did I say that all accurately? I never know. You guys make me feel kind of dumb. Um, but <laughs> um, Pam, what's the, what's the challenge with the pygmy slow loris? Um, pygmy slow lorises are faced with several challenges. One, they're um, in the pet trade and conservation. They're what? They're, they are kept as pets. Uh -huh. So oh, the pet they are trade. pulled from the wild. They're in the pet trade um, where we trade them as pets. And so conservation on the conservation side of things, they're really threatened. Because I mean, if any of you have seen them, they are absolutely some of the most beautiful, adorable creatures on the planet. They do have like enormous eyes and they are absolutely stunning. Um, and so people want them. You look at them and they're, you think, oh, they're so cute. But they do not do well as pets. No wild animal does well as pet, but they in particular, nocturnal, venomous, not good pets, right? So <laughs> conservation-wise, highly threatened. Um, from, a, from the zoo standpoint, they, we're not doing so well with them as far as being able to get them to reproduce. So population sustainability, which is a, a big focus for us, because we don't want to take them out of the wild and keep them in our zoos. We want to have sustainable populations and be able to manage them here successfully. Um, they're, they're not doing well. So we've been thinking, OK, why are they not doing well? So you look at how they live in the wild and you look at how we house them in captivity and you think, well, they're nocturnal, so we exhibit them in darkness so that we can see them do their natural behaviors. And then at our night, we turn the lights on. It gets really convoluted when you start talking about nocturnal prosimians because you're switching the light cycle. So it's light at night for them. We have the lights on and then during the day, it's dark. But the question is, well, are we doing that correctly? Because, because none of it is natural. None of it is natural light no, they're, that they're experiencing. They never experience light, natural indoors. light. We're, we're housing right. them indoors because we're changing the light. Right now, they're up in the primate house in the, I don't know, there's a. Nocturnal wing. In the nocturnal <laughs> wing of the primate house. They're up the hill in the corner. <laughs> in the light. <laughs> um, so. So, and you, but they're still not happy. They don't appear to well, be happy. Well, we don't know that they're happy. So our way of, and it's always hard to decide what's happy. Um, so are they exhibiting the behaviors that we would expect to see in the wild? So are they active when it's dark? Are they not active when it's light? And we had um, Grace Fuller, who has um, graduated from here with her PhD, spent, devoted her PhD to answering the question of the very specific question, which again gets to some of the challenges of this, what question do you ask? So historically, um, we across zoos have housed nocturnal animals under blue light because one of the reasons is if you house them under red light, they look scary. And if you house them under blue light, you can see them better. It's brighter, um, which is a problem because it's brighter. It's perceived better by our eyes. Well, it's also perceived better by their eyes. So they are housed in dark, but under blue light so that we can see them. They perceive that the best, so that's a problem for them. It disrupts a lot of things, including melatonin. Um, a lot of you know about melatonin because we turn the lights on all the time and we have disrupted our own sleep cycles, so many of us probably take melatonin to help regulate our sleep cycles. So Grace was able to collect saliva samples to measure melatonin in the nocturnal prosimians and did a comparative study looking at red light versus blue light. So red light, not perceived very well by the eye. That's why you know night vision goggles and things like that, cameras use red light because it doesn't get picked up as well versus blue light. And she found that the animals under red light did better. 
their melatonin cycles, their activity levels were better, and the blue light was actually not so good. So we've changed, and we've, at, we've been advocating that other institutions change. How long have they been housed under red light, Andy? Uh, just about two years. It was when the study ended. Uh -huh. And what's been the upshot of that? Well, the upshot of that is that they're showing more naturalistic behaviors and their um, processes seem to be levelized, levelized, I'm sorry, stabilized a bit uh -huh. um, with that. And so what will be interesting is if we can get more zoos to do that, which we're advocating for, which will have a greater sample size to further do a follow-up on the research and see, okay, well, it happened, it worked here, mm -hmm. but is it going to work there? And is it going to work at this institution? Um, because some institutions with nocturnal areas have a uh, different setup with different light that comes in through the front door. The nocturnal wing mm -hmm. is very uh, far set for the front doors of PCA, and so we were able to uh, cover up a lot of the uh, outside light from coming in, but not every institution has that. Um, are they reproducing? We have a baby. Yay! <laughs> Four or five months old now. I've no sense of time, but he's uh -huh. doing really well. But it's that's there are species that are not breeding that well in zoos, and part of this these could be the reasons. Are we housing them under the right light? Are we feeding them the right diet? Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of success with some of our nocturnal primates here, but we've also had some that haven't bred. And and why is that? And is there something we could be doing to improve that? What's a what, what's an example of a, an animal that you haven't had success with that you still can't figure out what's wrong? Well, going on the same theme. Yes. <laughs> um, with nocturnal primates. With nocturnal primates. Um, so we did this one project looking at red versus blue, uh -huh. but that led us to another question which we hadn't even considered. Um, Grace was measuring the light during their night, but we had to stop, and she measured it 24 hours. And what we realized was that the daytime light, so when they should be sleeping, was not very bright. So one of the questions we now have is, does light during their daytime affect any of this? Um, and there's suggestion in human literature, which is often where we turn now um, for answers or to get our next question. Should we make the daytime light brighter? Should it be bright during the day and dark at night? Are you also looking at, at like light that produces the certain qualities of UV radiation and that kind of thing that like you know that people put by their desks in the middle of the Cleveland winter? <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. It's a real well, that's where a lot of the so a lot of the research that we when we're asking these questions about nocturnal prosimians and going you know what does the pygmy slow loris light exposure have to do with anything? We look to seasonal affective disorder in humans, and I mean as Many of us who live in Cleveland know that you know winter is coming and gray skies are coming and it's going to be really dark all the time very soon. And that bothers some of us and it affects our mood and it affects how we feel and it affects our activity level and it makes us want to like curl up in a ball and well, yeah, And the pygmy slow lords is from Africa or is, where is it from? Mm -hmm. Asia. Asia. So what's so you do you, I mean all of that kind of stuff goes into you know when you're trying to design a new a new uh, an experiment or whatever you're thinking about the uh, the light they're exposed to at that latitude. Right. Right. But we're at the level the light levels that we're worried about we're not even going okay you know if you're at this latitude do you have 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of light we're really looking at can we um, mimic a sunny day. Right. Um, and where, maybe after we tweak that, we'll get to, do you need 13 hours of darkness and 11 hours of light? Um, but we're not, we're not even there yet. So that's, that's one of the biggest challenges is in the zoo world, probably in all research, but in the zoo world is you have to answer one question at a time. Mm -hmm. And you, you want to ask all the questions. You want to say, well, is it, you know, is it the amount of light? Is the brightness of the light? Is it the red light versus blue light? Is it what they're eating? Is it the space? But you can't. You have to answer each question separately. And you make one tiny little baby step, and then you have 47,000 other questions you have to ask. For, for each species. of the animals in the collection. Yeah. <laughs> um, bears. Yes. Andy. I, we were talking earlier about bears. There are five species of bears. A bear, 
or five species in the bear taxonomy, or as well, you said Cleveland earlier. Cleveland has here in Cleveland, Cleveland has five here at the species. zoo. I was yeah. I was going to finish that sentence ultimately, <laughs> um, but um, what are your concerns about the bear population at the zoo? Um, I, I think that um, not just the bear population at at Cleveland, but bear populations uh, in accredited zoos. Um, I think it's going to be one of our future challenges that. Uh, we have the talent and the resources to start tackling some of the challenges with bear species. Uh, you know, bear species, um, they're, they're kind of a tough group. Um, they're not as cute as gorillas or pygmy slow lorises, uh, but they certainly have challenges. And, you know, historically the past 20, 30 years, they've been managed the same way. Uh, these five species of bear that we have are from very di different geographical ranges all over the world. And traditionally, in zoos, they've all been managed the same way. Same diet, same exhibit, same furniture, um, as if they were all uh, Every bear? very similar. Really? Traditionally, in most zoos, that if you look at... Because they're bears. Because they're bears. And so... So they all get, like, rocky things and a tree over there and maybe some water? Basically. That's, oh. that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> and a den. And a den. Um, and so what we've seen over the past 10, 15 years is the decline in the reproduction success in bears. And uh, it's getting very challenging to uh, have sustainable populations, which we've talked about. And we're going to be put in a position, or in my mind, we're already uh, kind of behind the eight ball with that position. We need to start answering some of these questions of why aren't we reproducing successfully with several species of these bears? Um, is it the environment? Is it environmental choice? Is it nutrition? Is it the mates that they're with? Um, is it their light cycles? Or what is it in their environment that we can provide to increase the success rate of reproduction? So we do have sustainable populations. And so looking at these different aspects, it's going to take many years. As Pam said, you can only ask one question at a time and answer one question at a time, um, which we did start uh, a couple years ago. We started monitoring hormones in some of our female species of bears to see if they were cycling, because they might not have been cycling. Dr. Shook talked a you little bit about that You train them as well for year. blood draws? Yes, we do. In <laughs> fact, uh, you know where I'm going with this. Go. Um, in fact, uh, <laughs> we're working on uh, sloth bear research right now, and uh, the With really team, long nails. Apparently. Really long nails. They're <laughs> yeah. very cool. They are. Um, and uh, about uh, three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, the team was able to successfully have a voluntary blood draw on both the male and female sloth bears, which as far as we know, it's the first time it's ever been done in the United States. Pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. Uh, um, when, when that happens, like, do you, do, you, do you immediately start like emailing colleagues around the peers around the country and saying, you will never believe what we just did? <laughs> no, I quietly shut my office door and do a little dance, you know, a little. Um, <laughs> no, um, it really does well up a lot of pride in our organization with the, with the talent that we have in-house. We have a very deep bench. And being able to get these samples voluntarily um, it will allow us to not only monitor health, but start a asking some of the challenging questions. Um, it, it, we're just very fortunate at Cleveland to have such a broad skill set, and everybody really wants to work together to answer these questions. So I well up with pride a little bit. I, I know. I know, me too. <laughs> the, <clamped. laughs> how many of these investigations can the team handle at once? Like, how many investigations across how many that species? Is, that like, is a great question, because as Pam said, we could have 70 studies on, on um, every animal in our care. And so what we really have to do is sit down as a team and say, okay, where's our list of challenges? What are our priorities? What resources do we have? Because we, we can't do it all right away. We will mm -hmm. do it all, but just Eventually. not right away. Um, so we really have to work together and everybody has to give some skin on what their priority might be, might need to bump down a little bit to answer priority with another species. And so it's a lot of collaboration, a lot of uh, very honest conversation about what the reality of what we can attain in a certain period is. Um, but the outcome is uh, really impacting not only our organization, but other accredited zoos. So it is challenging to pick what you can do and what you can do great. This is a, a question that we didn't discuss before, so I hope you'll forgive me for asking it. Do you, do you, you, manage, you manage a lot of budget on this stuff. Yeah. And, um, and you are probably constantly trying to balance this uh, health investigations, experimentation, science stuff against the basic day-to-day -day operational needs of the zoo and the animals in the zoo. Um, 
Is that a big challenge for you? It is a big challenge. You know, it's, it's a challenge for me and uh, Dr. Lucas, who runs the research department, because we do share that budget. Um, and not only that, but our facility operations, some of our work is going to take some of their budget, some of our priorities, you know, modifying exhibits to uh, enhance the animal's life as well. That takes budget. So it, uh, it does come down to prioritization and, and what is your first priority, what will give the what you can get the greatest bang for your buck is mm -hmm. um, and what you can get immediately and what kind of has to be uh, a long-term goal um, and it how changes do you weigh, about like a, every day. How I think do you I weigh the anteater against today. the against the bear? I mean the I mean that's hard right? But that's... sometimes there's other strategies that you could use that are more cost effective that you say uh -huh. well until we have the money for that let's go ahead and try this and look into this and see if this works before we bring out the big financial impact projects. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's challenging. It's it's very challenging. I don't know how else to say I know, it. It I'm drives sure, me crazy I know. sometimes. I bet it does. <laughs> I bet it does. We're going to open it up to questions from all of you in a second. Um, but I, I thought we should spend a little time talking about the elephants because everybody walked up, up here past the elephant crossing, which has, I, I've forgotten what year the elephant crossing opened, but it, it's what, 11? 11. Thank you all so much for your support of that project. Um, right, Liz? Is that what I was supposed to say? Yeah. Okay. Um, but the, um, since 2011, though, it's changed a lot in small but meaningful ways. The, um, as I walked by uh, and I, I took a selfie and I tweeted it out with the hashtag 2015DSA, um, to which you can send your questions. Um, but um, there were all, uh, all four, there were four of the elephants gathered around that hanging bag of, of grass and, and food things. And that, was, that is something that when in 2011 didn't exist. And in fact, three weeks ago in that location didn't exist because I was here and there was a, an angry elephant batting something around <laughs> that was hanging off there. So, um, so uh, who, Elena, tell us about what's going on there, what you're trying out, what you're finding. Right, so we have a new exhibit, but there's also different ways you can feed the animals. And one of the great things we've implemented are these hay feeders. And so that's probably what you saw them crowded around. And so having a central feeding location like that, you can see how the herd is much more cohesive as well, and they're hanging together. And they also are building these bigger muscles as they lift their trunks up to pull the hay out of these hanging feeders. And so we have these new, this new exhibit, but we're also thinking of ways to continually work within it as well and, and impact the herd. Were those hanging, those hanging structures, that wasn't part of the original design of the crossing, right? Or was it? Um, no, those weren't a part of the original design. Um, so whose idea was that? Did they get a raise yet? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, where's Chris? Is that exploding? No? <laughs> uh, this was a, a lot of discussion about this. Uh, you know, we, uh, we have very talented uh, keeper staff that works in African Elephant Crossing, very talented uh, associate curator that, that works over there. And, and we also have a consultant that we bring in to kind of hold the mirror up to us and say, ah, you could do a little bit better here and you should uh -huh. do some work here. And, and he really started talking to us about um, the elevated feeder philosophy. And, and as uh, Chris Peterson is looking at how we're feeding elephants, you know, we, we put some hay right in front of them and they stand there and they do this. And, and so uh, he really wanted to pilot it out on the indoor um, parlors first, and, and we did that, and we, we saw some, they, they didn't get to it right away. The, um, one of the female elephants, Moshi, she was one of the last to pick up on it. She would wait till everyone else had dropped some on the ground, and she'd still just pick it up. <laughs> so it took a little bit for them to pick up, um, but they picked up on it so well, and we were starting to see not only changes in their, uh, their physical appearance, but also in their behavior. And so uh, from there, we decided to roll that into the outdoor habitats as well to increase their space, um, increase how much they have to move to acquire food, much, much like they do in the wild, and give them choices on where they want to feed. And so um, we've really seen a great impact on their um, health and on their uh, herd dynamics. Does the epidemiologist agree with your assessment of their health? Well, the, the nice thing is, is that we have been measuring it along the way. So not only do we make the changes, but we go and look and see the effect of those changes. Uh -huh. um, Meaning you ask them to present their ear, you draw the blood, you run the tests, and you found that they're like, if, what, what, what are you looking well, at there? Well, one of the, one of the changes that, that we made was to increase their foraging time. So not specifically these uh, raised hay feeders, but just 
Elephants spend a lot of time in the wild eating. So uh -huh. let's mimic that and increase the time they spend foraging. Um, and so the, the keepers were able to do that. They hid food in the, you know, in the enclosure and they did all these things so that there was more time spent feeding. And this you know, occurred over time and we were like, yay! And we had students who monitored the behavior and they were measuring it and they were saying, look, we can show you this graph, and I know Chris Kuhar said, don't show any graphs, but the graph went up, the behavior was improving, and things were great, and we were like, yay, we did this great work. But we also looked at the health parameters, and we were looking at, at measures of leptin, which is a hormone produced by fat cells, and we were looking at these things, looking at trying to measure their health, and we found that those things, which we didn't want to creep up, were creeping up a little bit. So we, we said, okay, we're improving their behavior, we think that they are doing what they would be doing in the wild, but we need to find a way to do that without having this increase in leptin or body fat. Um, we weren't actually showing significant increases in their body weight, but when you think about how big an elephant is, that you can gain a good bit of weight and not actually change your weight it's that percentage, much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we got even more creative and said, okay, we need to find ways for them to forage without letting them get lots of food all at once. So one of, the, one of the things that came up was these hay feeders where they actually have to work harder for their food. So the whole concept of having to work for your food rather than having it handed to you um, is really a, a concept that's being ad adopted throughout zoos. Mm -hmm. but, but Cleveland Metro Park Zoo is really taking that, embracing it and saying, you know, animals like to work. Mm -hmm. That's what they, you know, in the wild, they're their work for an elephant is to go out and spend most of your day interacting with your herd and eating. Do you ever wish you could um, put a pedometer on them and see if they get to 10,000 steps? No question. <laughs> I'm, I'm only half joking. I'm, I, I'm almost cringing because we did that. So I, that is, <laughs> <laughs> that, that we do a lot of that in fact. Um, we put them on the elephants, and we put them on the rhinos, and we've tried to put them on the armadillos, and we Failed. do that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's great. In fact, we wanted to put them on the fusa. I don't know what that is. The, <laughs> um, have you seen the movie Madagascar? Yeah. Okay, you know the carnivore who eats the lemurs? It's a no. fusa. Okay. And it's a long, looks like a long cross between a cat and a... It's like a mongoose. Ferret. Okay. <laughs> but huge and muscular and really, really, we have two of them and you should go up and see them. Will. Um, it's on my bucket list. So they, they are shaped, one, they're carnivores and two, they're big and they're very long, um, mustelid shaped. Um, so they don't have a good place you could put a actograph or a pedometer uh -huh. on them. You know, you can't collar them easily. So um, Jason Work, one of our graduate students, said we can't put a pedometer on the FUSA, let's put it on his wheel. So we measured how much activity, how much time the FUSA was using his wheel uh -huh. by putting a pedometer on the wheel. Oh, sort of a proxy for yeah. his, for, for things. So we, I mean, we have to sort of do that, think outside of the box, figure out how you can do it all the time. What, so we need to get to your questions, and I apologize for hogging so much of the panelists' time. Um, what's so fascinating to me is how hard you guys work on all of this science that is ostensibly invisible to 98% of zoo visitors, and I think that's um, a crime, frankly. So Chris, get on that. Um, <laughs> let's get to questions from all of you. We've got one question back here, and I think somebody's coming around with a, a microphone. Thank you, Rachel. I, think well, I know you can shout it, but it'd be easier for other people if you don't. All right, I have two. Wonderful. The nocturnal primate, wouldn't the moon have to be substituted, you know, like they are out in the wild? Mm. That's a great question. I think that's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> so that's, that gets into the, one of the many questions that needs to be asked. And one of, the reasons that, one of the reasons that people have said that blue light is used more than red light is to sort of mimic the moonlight. But the intensity of, of moonlight versus the lights that we have, very different. 
and getting that light versus dark. Um, and the moon changes every day. And the moon changes every day. And, right. and just that whole seasonal change, whether it's in light or diet or many other things, temperature, we, those are questions that need to be asked. Okay, Somebody better get I feel so too. sad for the pygmy slow loris. And Don't the nocturnal ones. We are gonna fix I know you're doing the best. I know you're doing great, but it but it just seems like I mean, if if you were sort of you know ripped out of your world and held in captivity, and then and then they switch night and day on you. I mean, it just sounds a little torturous. I'm just saying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was that not appropriate? Go ahead. Your second question, ma'am. Yes. That's <laughs> right. Ixne on the editorial <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. Is about the bears. I mean, aren't we all taught in school that bears should hibernate and we put them in a zoo and we wake them up every day? You know, that's a very good question and uh, something that uh, is the 92% that we don't share is um, most of our bear species, I believe all of our bear species right now have free choice access and if you come here in the winter now, you might not see the black bears out on exhibit, um, which then presents a slew of emails of why don't you have black bears on exhibit, but we provide that choice to them on where they want to be. Um, you know, they do definitely uh, become slower and less responsive in the winter, um, at least for the black bear and the brown bear, but by us providing them space choice on where they want to be, uh, you know, it does allow them to have a lazy day inside uh, once in a while, which I'm still waiting for Chris to let us do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Curator <laughs> hibernation day. Uh, we've got two up front here. <laughs> We're constantly hearing how endangered the polar bears are in their natural habitat. And yet my understanding is that we've lost the one here. Is there any way that we can help save them by having them come to the zoos instead of leaving them in the wild where they are having trouble on their own? That is a uh, discussion, panel discussion all on its own. So uh, zoos, along with uh, led other leaders in uh, North America, Fisheries and Wildlife Services, are working on legislation to uh, possibly be able to do that. The Marine Mammal Protection Act prevents us from bringing even orphan polar bears uh, in to the United States. And so they're working heavily on legislation with that um, to be able to do that, bringing them back to this zoo. There are lots of ways to help the polar bears without bringing them back to this zoo. But legis we're working on legislation, but I think that we also need to get some more research done and see why we weren't successful in having a sustainable population in, in captivity. Um, you know, the answer isn't always go back to the wild and bring them in. In fact, it's, it's coming to a close. That door is closing for zoos in general. So a lot of this research to ensure sustainable populations is, is becoming more of a focus. Now, you know, the, the legislation discussions will go on between accredited zoos and U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife Services, but it, it is a very challenging topic that is uh, very heavily being debated right now. Another question? I think we had another one up here. Yeah, she's coming with the microphone. Right here. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, with the animals that are, the primates that are nocturnal, and this is probably a dumb question, but I, I was wondering I asked a bunch of dumb questions already. The sunlight helps them to absorb calcium in their bones, and would not having regular sunlight available to them, but maybe that's not a, even an issue in the wild because they sleep during the daytime, so I don't know where they are. So I, I don't know, Do you, does that make sense? That is not a dumb question at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one that we ask about a lot of species. So for a lot of our species, we house them indoors, whether they're nocturnal or not. Um, so the whole question of, does it need UV light? Does it need calcium from its diet? Um, we have, we're asking that question with the red rumped agouti, totally, you know, who species. wouldn't ask that Who about wouldn't? the red rock? <laughs> what is that would be the first question. But um, it's, <laughs> it's a moderately sized, not an enormously large rodent, not like a capybara. Um, anyway, it, it, is, it has problems with um, too much vitamin D. So the whole spectrum of questions that you could ask just with UV light and do you get enough calcium and do you get too much and is it all from your diet or do you need it from sunlight, every different species you essentially sort of need to ask that question. Um, 
we use the broad sweeping, okay, we think it needs vitamin D in its diet until proven otherwise, and we think it needs UV light until proven otherwise, but, but we run into that question, you know, it's one of those fill in the species and then you have to ask that question. It's a challenge. Here's a science question from Twitter. Do zoos really share research in a timely manner or is it more competitive? Probably a spectrum. <laughs> I mean, there's certainly groups that do collaborate together and, and share research right away. I know when I wrote up my dissertation, I sent a little sort of cheat sheet to all the zoos that had participated of this is the quick notation of what I found with your animals that were in my study. But I think there's been other times where it might take a while for results to get back. Or... Mm -hmm. it, it's also challenging. Um, I, I would say that zoos are more collaborative and share information more easily than sort of the ivory tower academic setting publish or perish. Um, one of the challenges, and Elena can elaborate on this, one of the challenges is if we, so we did a diet study with our two gorillas and we found something and we reported it, you know, in a meeting. And one of the risks is that information is taken and spreads like wildfire. You know, you can solve all the health problems of gorillas by feeding this diet and it became known as the biscuit-free diet because we weren't feeding processed biscuits. There was so much more to it than that. It was a high fiber, low starch diet, but it became known as the biscuit-free diet. And one of the real concerns we had was that zoos were going to stop feeding biscuits, completely change the nutrition of the gorillas and not maybe manage it to the specifications that we thought were appropriate. Um, with the high fiber and low starch and carefully controlling these and making sure that all the vitamins and minerals were in the diet even though they weren't in getting the biscuit. So one of the risks with spreading information and sharing information is, is that if, if it's not done carefully, sometimes people take the idea and run with it, but mm -hmm. they miss the, the real concept of the idea. So how often are you and others here, all of you and others here, in conversation with uh, your counterparts at other zoos to say, hey, here's what we're doing, or, or like, I'm trying this, what are you guys, what do you know about this? Like, is that happening a lot? Dozens or of times a day, dozens uh -huh. of times a day. Uh, the, the zoo uh, world is a very small world and you make your connections uh, very quickly and very purposefully and you know who the go-to people are regarding certain topics. I think every one of us uh, could say that we easily have 30 or 40 emails regarding questions mm -hmm. uh, around our field of expertise. That's good to know. And then 100 where we're asking questions. Yeah. You right, know. 100 you're sending out. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? How did that work? Got another question over here. Okay, um, so with the species you have problems reproducing with, are you implementing any reproductive strategies, like when birds grab sticks and show them to the females, and the females either deny them or put them in their nest, is there any of that incorporated into the exhibits with the bears, or are the females just rejecting them because they couldn't build, they couldn't scratch a tree enough, or is it just that the female doesn't think the male is strong enough for her kin or anything? I can answer this with mandrels. It's extremely complicated. So you've heard Dr. Shook talk a lot of, last year about how she monitored hormones and that type of thing, but how we actually implement that is really difficult. So we have a group of four mandrels right now, two males, two females. Um, we cannot keep them all together because if the females are with the males, then the daughter will be more aggressive towards the mom. So what we have to do, we know when the female's cycling because we have a great endocrinology lab that can tell us when she's fertile. So we have the science, but actually the reproductive strategy of managing that is we have to do little visits where we quickly put the group together, we separate out the older female, we let the male breed the younger female, and then we separate them all back again, and the, we have an older male that has to run out of the way. It's very complicated. We do it right when we know she's fertile, so we track her every month, and we do this crazy little visit, and we just try to set it up for as much success as possible. But you have to know all the individuals you have in a group, and you have to, it's complicated. They don't make it easy just because you know exactly when a female is cycling. Love imagining the team meeting that morning. <laughs> yeah, like mandrel conjugal visit day, woohoo! That's exactly what it is. Yeah. 
<laughs> Did you want to add something to that? Or <laughs> no? no? Okay. I You're missed those meetings. I <laughs> <laughs> Do we have another question? Over here. Oh, over there, and then over there. Oh. All right. So not to diminish the importance of anyone's work by any means, but it seems that there's a sliding scale between applied and theoretical work. How much does qualitative versus quantitative work apply into that, and how it's related into, I guess, the application within the zoo itself? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, everyone's looking at me, so I'll take a stab at that one. So that is a, a very challenge. I will answer it um, with an example. I'll use a story. Use a story. I'll use a story. Yeah. So um, we are looking at heart disease in great apes in, across AZA. It's a multi-institutional study. We have participation by a lot of institutions. We're getting blood samples. We're getting cardiac evaluations. We are measuring as much as we can, as best we can, across an entire population of animals. So we are being as quantitative as we can. We have another challenge with um, armadillos, screaming hairy armadillos, very small population, not reproducing well, um, breeding well, producing babies, babies not surviving. Um, we have several animals here at the zoo. They're small, they're um, hard to access, they don't have long arms that they could provide a blood sample, so training them is very difficult. Um, and we're sort of stuck with what we can measure. We wanna look at, at how we can improve their health and reproduction, but we don't know what to measure. So Elena and I have, it's sort of a um, favorite subject of ours. We want to do something, we want to make some difference so that we can improve their health, but we don't know what it is. So we look at the natural history and we say, okay, you know, they eat a lot of insects, can we change their diet to better mimic an insectivore diet, and would that help with reproduction? So we have gone round and round. These are one of the species that we've tried to put Actograph, the little pedometers on, to measure activity. Um, we've gone round and round on what, what we can do. And essentially what we've decided to try is come up with a diet that we think is reasonable, change the diet, put the males and females back together again, and see if we can have a live baby that lives you know, past 30 days. And that would be our sort of measure of success. Is that quantitative? It, it's not even really qualitative. It's really, you know, a crapshoot and we're not really measuring anything and one anyone could argue that what we did had no bearing on that. Um, interpreting it is going to be almost impossible. Um, we're not going to publish that in science. That's not going to get out in the literature. It probably won't even be a presentation anywhere if we're successful. But it would be one step where we could at least see if we're making a difference. So we run the spectrum from multi-institutional, collaborations with MDs and universities and measuring things that, you know, even the finest human health lab is just scratching the surface at measuring to what do we do with these teeny tiny little creatures and how can we improve their health? Um, Did you want to say so, something, Amy? Yeah, I would like to just speak to the applied part. One of the, um, what I feel the luxuries of working at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo is, is that we do have a on-site, very talented science staff. So as we are applying some of the findings that um, they're, they're showing us, we'll make management changes and say, okay, could you look at this? And we're literally doing science-based management of our collection. So there is a great impact to the animals in our care of what we are applying based on the, re based on the research and findings that we're doing in-house. Um, a, a lot of zoos don't have those resources to be able to do that. So I would say the application of the uh, research and science that we do occurs every single day here. Maybe not with every single species every day, but it is a constant loop of feedback. Okay, we're making this management change. How's that impacting uh, the animals in our care? And, and it, it really is a highly sophisticated greased wheel. Um, we can't do everything all at once as we talked about, but you, you, pick it, you do have to pick and choose your battles kind of. 
Let's take the question over here. Yeah, okay. she's right behind you. Hi. Um, Thank you. I just want to follow up to the question regarding, regarding research and sharing information. So I hear you talking about limited resources. I hear you talking about prioritizing, uh, which everybody has to do, we all have to do in our lives. And I heard you say that um, you know the zoo family, you know everybody. So as a person not knowing anything about zoos, just loving animals, but not knowing anything about what you guys do, my question would be, if the zoo family across the United States or even the world is a small family and you know everybody, how do you guys, is there, is there a body of governance that will say, okay, the Cleveland Zoo is going to work on the cheetah project that you guys are doing? And uh, you mentioned that the bears, um, you would like to do something about the bear population reproduction, but you can't because right now that's not a priority. You have other priorities. Wouldn't you say, well, the San Diego Zoo can do that project? So you share sort of like the workload and everybody comes together with answers for best practice. Like that is like in my mind, like this perfect place. Does that <laughs> work like that? I can speak to that somewhat. It's so in some sense, yes, it, it can, but it's probably not as easy as that. So there's the association of zoos and aquariums and within that there's species survival plans for each species. And so I serve as the research advisor for the gorilla species survival plan. So what we'll do is if someone has a research project that could benefit the gorilla population, they'll send it through the species survival plan and we can either decide to endorse, approve, or you know, it's not a good study. If we endorse it and say this is really important for gorillas, this is gonna answer something about their husbandry and management in zoos, that means something. That means the gorilla species survival plan has read this, they think it's really good science and you should participate and more zoos will do that. So that, that occurs to varying degrees in the different species survival plans depending on how much they, they look at that and they embrace research. So I think it's happening and I do think that there is some collaboration with that, um, but it's not, it's not perfect. And, and just to broaden that perspective, there's also the um, European Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and there's beginning to be a lot of collaboration between um, American zoos and the European zoos. Dr. Mandy Shook is really uh, leading the forefront on collaborating on equine reproduction, uh, not only in the United States, but partnering with the Europeans to uh, perfect some research and techniques to make it easier for sustainable populations. Uh, is, it, is the collaborations growing fast enough no, they, ne they never go fast enough, uh, but they are, they are growing, and it's because people are willing to put in that extra effort to build the relationships and build the communication and kind of give the underlying goal of what, what the project is for. Do you have another question? In the back. Go ahead. So I actually have two questions. Um, one is regarding the blood draws that are done on animals without anesthesia, which I find amazing. Um, my question about that, I know you slowly train them to get used to you, like touching their tail and getting the pressure. Do they still freak out or get mad when they feel the poke of the needle, or do you shave their fur or apply numbing cream, or how do you deal with that? Yeah, it uh, varies by individual, but we have um, go uh, one gorilla who is afraid of needles. <laughs> I really think he has a phobia of it. So when we would see, when he would watch um, the other male gorilla getting his blood drawn, you could just see his eyes widening and he's staring at it like, oh, I, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> so we, um, you know, we would poke him with a, he knew the difference between a blunt and a sharp needle. So if we were working with a blunt needle, he'd be fine, he'd participate in the session. As soon as he saw us with the regular needle, he wouldn't come anywhere near it. So we, um, started using a numbing cream on him, and that actually worked really well, but he's, we're still having some, we can get blood on him occasionally, but he will occasionally just see the needle and he'll start to react. So we're trying to kind of keep his behavior going because he just really hates the needle. So yeah, there are some animals that really have a hard time with it, and then there's the cheetahs. We can get a blood draw on them every day, no problem. So it just varies. Okay, hmm. Thank you. Um, our second question is about the nocturnal animals, how you said you apply red light now. We were wondering, when it goes to, from light to dark, do you apply the red light gradually, like a sunrise, or is it sudden? And also, we were wondering, would it have any effect on the animal's behavior 
if you applied natural effects such as like a blowing breeze or if it rained on them or if they heard sounds of birds. <laughs> you can answer that You're one. You know probably just lights. giving us uh, <laughs> more ideas. Um, it's, it is a sudden shift. The lights just turn off or they just come on. Um, we, you know, I think the idea of gradually doing it is interesting. I have no clue if a breeze or a frame would stimulate those sorts of behaviors. We really, we don't know, but there's a lot of things that we can test and try. The one thing we try to do is we try to do one thing at a time, because if we, you know, say we start a nice mist in the exhibit, we start a gradual light change, and you know, we have breezes flowing through, and all of a sudden we have babies galore. Well, which one was it? Was it all of them? So we try to do it one at a time and really figure out what aspect is affecting uh, what we, what we want to see, and that can make it kind of a slow process, but we hope more accurate and we can explain better what, what we did right. Um, we have a, a, our final question is going to be this one from Twitter, uh, asking if each of you could share how and why you chose this career, which I think is a nice way to end. Who wants to start? I guess I will since they're both looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. It, it, occasionally pops up in my own mind why I chose this career. Um, and for me, through the evolution of my career, I, I started as a zookeeper um, and then worked my way into the position that I'm in now. Um, and as I've gone through that evolution, my reasons for being in this field have also evolved. Um, you know, initially it was to uh, impact the animals in our care the best way that I could and give them the best resources and environments they could have. And it's kind of shifted now in my position where the reason I'm in this field is to prepare the future generations by having very talented staff um, that are smart and innovative and giving them resources to continue to sharpen their skill set to stay on this path for the future and really, you know, have us lead the evolution of zoos as we go into this next phase of zoos and be leaders. And so that's kind of why I'm in it now. It is very, a very strong passion of mine is to develop the future zoo leaders. Elena? Um, I've always loved zoos. I have a report that I did when I was in first grade about how zoos are becoming more naturalistic. And they're just, so I've always just been obsessed with zoos, but I love exotic animals. And so that led me to where I'm at now. But what I love about what I do right now is that I still get to participate in the research, I get to apply research, I get to think big picture about animals, but I also get to work down to the individual level where I, where I can see the same monkey every day and have that relationship with them and inspire the keepers as well and, and work with them individually. And I, so I love being able to do both, to really work with individual animals and people and to also still have some ability to work with big picture questions as well. Mm -hmm. What about you, Pam? Um, well, I haven't always loved zoos. I've, um, I've always loved wildlife, and I've always been fascinated by wildlife. And I really wanted to go into free-ranging wildlife. That's what I wanted to do, you know, be out in the wild working with animals. Um, and as I went to vet school and fell in love with veterinary medicine um, and learned more about zoos and keeping animals in captivity and recognizing some of these syndromes and unexplained uh, issues that they have, I became fascinated with improving their lives and figuring out why we have these syndromes and figuring out what we could do because I didn't think the answer was to not have zoos. I felt that zoos made a, a significant impact on a lot of people and changed their minds towards protecting what I wanted to protect, which was the wildlife in the wild. Um, and that if we were going to still have zoos, which I felt now, although I didn't always feel that way, what was justified and worthwhile, we needed to do the best that we could to figure out how to best care for them. And that's how I ended up where I am. Excellent. Thank you all so much, Dr. Pam Dennis, Dr. Elena Less, and Andy Cornett. Awesome. That was really fun. So with that, I just want to one more time say thanks to Pam, Elena, Andy, as well as Dan for a, a great evening tonight. Can we all give them one more round of applause? Uh, I also want to thank Billy Steffi, who wasn't able to be here, but it's through her support that something like this is possible. Um, 
I just want to say how important an event like this is to me because this is who we are. Um, you know, we don't have all the answers. We don't. I'll, I'll be completely honest. We don't have all the answers, but we're not afraid to ask the questions. And that's how we're going to move forward um, and, and move modern zoos forward. We're going to ask questions. We're going to find out. We're going to, we're going to keep looking. We're not afraid. And, and maybe we should be, but we're not. <laughs> We're going to keep working on this, that, that science is the essence of what we do. A lot of institutions will talk about science. Um, a lot of institutions will even support science. But it's, it's not everyone here is a scientist, but we're going to use science. We're going to answer questions. We're going to change what we do. Um, a saying that I've started using is, if it's good enough, it's not. And, and that's how we look at things here. We're going to try and, and, and get better all the time. So this is just a this fantastic small portion of, of my staff is just that, a small portion of my staff. We have amazing people, from vets to keepers to curators to vet techs to, to scientists, and they all do a great job. So Dan said a couple times that we're not doing enough to get that, that behind the scenes stuff out there. This is that first step, and we're gonna do more of it, and I hope you all come out and hear more about it. Our conservation programs, our education programs, uh, our science, animal care, all of it. So check your email. Check your social media, because we're going to be out there, and we're going to be providing more opportunities for us, for us to tell you about what it is that we do. So with that, thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Please drive safe going home. Thank you very much. And, and put us on your calendar for next year, the David Steffi Lecture, the 12th annual David Steffi Lecture. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>